Dealt with all the sign-ins back there. I call this meeting to order of the House Regulated Industry Committee. Um, for the agenda today, we have new bills in front of us, but today we're gonna have a short presentation to the committee to rehash their memories about the, uh, the structure of the three-tier structure of the alcohol industry in Georgia. And then we also, since this seems to be the committee of favorite about doing regulatory uh, uh, writings when it comes to any possibilities of any gaming, we're going to be showing uh, a video that was taken a couple of years ago uh, from the special committee on gaming to give them a better knowledge in case anything comes or when it comes to this committee, if it comes or to the floor of the house. Uh, for those in attendance, in radio land as well as the ones here personally today if anyone at some point uh while we're in a slow mode it wishes to give just a short presentation to the committee about their respective industry or clients we'll be more than glad to entertain that if they talk to jan first now before i start today i have the i have the distinct privilege of presenting a committee pen to one of our newest members. He seems to have been anxious about this and uh, I wanted to see if he would show up for the second meeting and he has. Uh, so we're going to, at this point, we're gonna go ahead and pin him, even though some of our regular members don't always wear their pens. And the good news is I see our second newest member is in attendance now, so he'll get one also. Derek, since you've chosen to be here two meetings in a row, you get your own special committee men for regulated industries. There you go. Wear it with pride. Absolutely. In private, I'll tell you what that uh, lightning bolt stands. Thank you, gentlemen, and thank you to the members for being here today. Uh, first off, we have. Uh, the alcohol favorites here. Uh, if y'all could come on up, guys. Now, Casey, do y'all have you and Martin? Do y'all have a, a video, or just y'all just gonna speak? All right. If y'all wouldn't, I'm gonna turn the floor over to you. To normal committee room. Normal. Should work. All right. Ready to go. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Casey Honeyman. I'm the executive director for the Wine and Spirits Wholesalers of Georgia. Uh, and I'm here joined today with the executive director of the Georgia Beer Wholesalers Association, Martin Smith. Uh, and, and really this is, I uh, hope we don't wanna take up too much of your time, but the chairman asked us to be here to provide a, a, a very high level uh, overview of Georgia's three tier system and really how we got here. Um, and, and while we're here on behalf of the beverage alcohol industry, certainly there are, there are other um, uh, other members of this industry, great industry that uh, we're, we're certainly not speaking for, but just really trying to provide a high level um, overview here. So I'm going to cover some of the history of, of how Georgia and the rest of the country came to the unified system known as the three tier system on uh, how it still is very much in play in, in 2021 and beyond. Uh, Georgia, like all 50 states, really has a unique history with alcohol, um, and uh, this really brings me to, to the gentleman that's on the first slide. That is Congressman William Upshaw, and he was a Democrat from Noonan, Georgia, who is holding an umbrella over the U.S. Capitol, and he claimed that he was the driest of the dries, and so back... Uh, in 1918 or so, right around Prohibition time, he went up to Washington, D.C. to lead the charge for Prohibition. And it just goes to show how far we've truly come as a, as a state and as a country in terms of the sentiment of, of alcohol. 
Uh, so it, it really goes without saying that alcohol is the only commercial good that is the subject of not one, but two constitutional amendments in the, uh, to the U.S. Constitution. The first being with uh, the 18th Amendment, uh, which uh, put prohibition in place. And, and this was um, before we had any type of system and any type of structure as we have today. Um, uh, alcohol manufacturers owned retail outlets and used this as an avenue to truly aggressively uh, market and push their products. And, and this led to a lot of things, but it led to over abuse, um, uh, unfair marketing practice, a vertical integration, uh, and it led to folks like our, our buddy Congressman Upshaw to go up to, to Washington, D.C. to say, hey, enough is enough. We need, we need to shut this down entirely. So in between 1920 and 1933, there was a, a good 13-year gap where truly the mafia ruled um, the, the distribution of the alcohol um, in, in, this, in the United States. Uh, the 21st Amendment was ratified and was... Um, uh, ratified by President Roosevelt in 1933, and it ended the failed experiment that was prohibition. And wisely, uh, what this led to was a decentralization from the federal model and led to a more state-based model. And so the 21st Amendment kicked authority out to the states to uh, regulate alcohol as they see fit. And that brings us to today. So over the last 85 years, um, we have all 50 states put into place what is now known as the three-tier system. Uh, so again, uh, this is something that I'm sure as legislators, um, and you've heard from our friends in the hallway, um, this is a, a term that you've heard time and time again, but might not know exactly who's who or what's what. And so that's where uh, we hope to kind of educate a little bit today. So uh, again, it's, it's worth noting that after the 21st Amendment, all 50 states uh, put into, in effect, some sort of three-tier system. Uh, so Georgia is not unique or alone in this. This is something that uh, not only does Georgia do, but all 50 states do. And if you look up there um, on the, the first, um, the first uh, dot there on the left is the first tier, and this is made up of, of manufacturers. And these manufacturers in the, in the beverage alcohol world are, of course, made up of, of wineries, breweries, and distilleries, not only in Georgia, uh, but across the country, and not only across the country, but across the world. Uh, they create the product, they put the juice in the bottle, they slap a label on it, they work incredibly hard to put together uh, what they they uh, feel the, the marketplace demands. And then they sell it to uh, our, our members, Martin, our members, uh, who are distributors and wholesale distributors in the middle tier, uh, the second tier. We then pay the state of Georgia taxes on excise and get that product to wherever the consumer ultimately will buy it. Um, and you can tell on the third tier uh, in blue on the right there, it's really split into two different channels, as we like to call it, on and off premise. Off premise is comprised of any retail account, a convenience and gas station, a grocery store, a packaged liquor store, uh, anywhere where you would, would buy it for off premise consumption. And the second channel is really on premise. This is bars and restaurants. Uh, you know, think of State Farm Arena and the like. So uh, the important thing to note here between the, the system is that after the 21st Amendment was put into place, all 50 states put into, into um, effect a three-tier system. And the importance of that is truly to, to get away from a vertically integrated model, which uh, prevents monopolies. And every single tier has a very individual and distinct responsibility. Uh, again, breweries, distilleries, wineries make the product sell it to wholesale distributors who pay the taxes, market and merchandise and warehouse and get it out to wherever uh, the, the, to the third tier, wherever the consumer then buys. So again, uh, all three are, are individual, um, uh, individually operated and, and we really tried to not blur the lines between, between the tiers. Thanks, KC. Again, I'm Martin Smith with the Beer Wholesalers Association, but as KC's described how it came to be and how it got put into place and, the, and the, how the structure is separated. Um, one thing that the structure in Georgia does or many of the things that Georgia does is it allows for a process to collect and remit the taxes, encourages competition, which means it's a fair access to the market for these um, producers, uh, pre prevents the monopolies as you see and ensures uh, consumer safety. One thing that I like to tell folks when they talk about alcohol particularly legislators who are looking at making policy changes, or is this system is a victim of its own success, meaning that alcohol is a dangerous product. It can be unfortunately abused, um, and it has been, and it can be detrimental. 
but we've got a system that that your predecessors and you continue to make that make it a very safe environment to purchase this. And you know you're not going to get anything counterfeit. You've got a system to where people of age and responsible people will be able to consume this. It also, as Larry O'Neill said years ago, it's one of the most reliable sources of income or revenue for our state. Every month, these excise taxes are remitted. Um, the, so you all play the part of the policymakers here. Um, and in Georgia, you have created a system that is not static. It's constantly moving. And, it's, and the best way that it's been changed is through industry involvement. And, and, and a good example of that is last year when many of you addressed the retail delivery bill. And at that time, the, the people involved were invited everybody to be a part of this conversation. And they wanted to be a part of the conversation. And they were, and it was industry driven on wanting to, to make a change with their desires. But you have the laws that you make, the Department of Revenue, which regulates that. And y'all have got a great strong commissioner here in our state. And each of the, each of the participants in the tier deal with each of those. But an important part is knowing that it's separated for a reason and why it's that way and that it's not something that is not moved and progressed with time. There's constant changes to it, but the best way to do that, and I think in everybody's opinion, is having the industry being involved. So um, and that's, that's what we have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Do we have any of the committee members that want to have any questions for them to expand on? No? You know what? We've done a pretty good, y'all have done a good job over the years of uh, educating folks. Now, what's your number? Two. Two. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> which obviously is a smart way to do it but walk, walk me through is just an uneducated on this topic uh, member um how how is that um what how is that whole process facilitated so uh, similar in each of the categories but on the beer side particularly the the brewer produces the product right we purchased the wholesalers purchased the product from them and then they sell it to re licensed retail accounts which is a critical point there that by design you make sure that you're pur that someone's purchasing it a legal product from a licensed right. facility that a licensed person is receiving that and it gets delivered to somebody that has a license a verified license on the wall there's two types of excise tax in georgia you have and it's defined in our code and on the beer side it's essentially two dollars and 28 cents per case of beer a dollar twenty of that goes to the locals, each taxing jurisdiction where that was sold, and a dollar eight goes to the state for each one of them. And so, when we sell that product in to that retail account and collect that fund, we are collecting, and then we remit that the following fifteenth of the month. Okay, so the, this after you're, you're warehousing the product is untaxed paid uh, products, and, and then when it's sold to the retailer, that's the point in time that you've collected the money. And it's in turn remitted to part, the state. Part of it. If it were to stay in our warehouse for more than 30 days, then that tax is due to the state. Okay. It's not due to the locals until we sell it into that retail account. Okay. That answers my question. Thank you. Yep. Thanks. Uh, Martin, has there ever been a movement to, to do like a penny beer tax or at the, at the end user instead of taxing the product along the process? Is there, is there ever any thought to doing that? Cause you know, in a lot of other areas in taxation, we don't tax the product as it rolls, we tax at the end. So I don't, I didn't know. I mean, it doesn't matter to me where it's collected. I was just wondering if there's ever been a, a movement for that, like a penny beer, wine, liquor tax that would cover the same amount of excise. I think the, the best answer to that is, is by having it come from the wholesale level, you have a, a, a smaller customer base effectively from the state and there's a, a clear and auditable, uh, uh, 
audit trail that goes from there. And if you're dealing with 20,000 plus retailers, uh, certainly not throwing them under the bus versus 25 plus wholesalers, that's a centralized tax uh, tax access point for the state of Georgia to do so. I'm unaware of, of a move to go towards the 20,000 plus retailers versus that, so. Yes, sir. That's me. Yeah. Hey there. Thank you for uh, for coming to educate us today. I think I had a quick question. I understand one of the benefits of the three tier system is that we are ensuring also you mentioned the safety of the product or the quality. Um, and I was just as a lay person, I'm just kind of curious, it, it, does that mean that the, at the distributor or wholesale level that there is some degree of quality control going on there or is all or does all of that take place? Um, on the manufacturers and the quality control, the quality checking, um, or, or does the distributor wholesale play a role in that as well? And what would that look like? In addition to quality control, which would be on the front end of the production, there's a chain of custody issue that comes with it. You wanna make sure that it is delivered to that, it's, it's in the custody of someone who's responsible for it and it doesn't become adulterated prior to it becoming available to the consumer. And, and one thing I'd add is, is supplier, our supplier partners as, as wholesale distributors, uh, we're talking about the breweries, distillers, and wineries. They, they have very stringent uh, rules and regs from a federal level that they have to adhere to. So these folks are making quality product, whether it's beer, wine, or liquor. Uh, and, and really the, the part of that success that Martin talked about from a three-tier perspective is that wholesalers and retailers, and so we're, we're only buying from primary sources. And so the idea of um, illegal, illicit, counterfeit goods coming through the chain, right? The last time you showed up at a bar uh, and you question anything that was behind that bar in the United States is, is very never, right? It doesn't even cross our minds because of that primary sourcing that we have. We're only buying from licensed manufacturers that are uh, adhered to those strict standards on the federal level. We're only selling to licensed retailers. So that chain of custody, as Martin was mentioning, is very, very stringent. I understand. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Any other questions from any of the committee members? So in fact, the importance of this, uh, of the three tier system is one, is it to be sure that uh, Americans have their choice in Georgians, that we're protecting them from organized crime, being able to control an out of control market. And secondly, as a mental health condition, we're, we're preserving people not to be like Congressman Upshaw and die the unhappiest man in America. <laughs> Would that be pretty close? I'd say so, yes, sir. Thank you, gentlemen. We appreciate you being here today. Thank you, and th thank you for the time. And again, look forward to working with you guys on, on anything dealing with alcohol. Thanks so much. Thank you. Next up for the committee members, uh, as a footnote to this, in 2019, Speaker Austin, because of the interest in uh, legalizing gambling in the state of Georgia, Speaker Austin appointed a special committee uh, and this, this committee, this very committee was also part of that. Uh, and that dealt with um, the special committee on the legalization of gambling. At that time, we had testimony around the state and for your entertainment today, and for those who need to have their memories refreshed about what it takes to do such a thing, is we've got a roughly a 20 minute video <laughs> and uh, we're gonna play that at this time and that way we can ask questions if any of the committee wants to get involved to ask questions. And uh, so if we would, Jan, are you ready? I'm ready, here it goes. And it's supposed to start. <laughs> give everyone an idea of what our purpose is going forward and is to consider the <coughs> regulatory environment, uh, the tax and incentive environment, as well as the economic development opportunities uh, that would be available uh, to our citizens by attracting new industries into the state of Georgia. There's revenue that would come in two, two cycles, quite frankly, in my opinion, on gaming in Georgia. 
One would be uh, while the proceeds, taxes on the proceeds from gaming is one, but there's also a lot of other things that will be looked at and hopefully it'll come out during the course of these three days. And that's the general economic development. We're looking at sales taxes that would be magnified off of this, uh, the hotel, uh, hotel taxes and revenue from that, uh, food services, entertainment and all of that. So this is certainly not just an issue about gaming per se. This is an industry that doesn't want tax incentives. They come in and they go into business and they do what's, what they do. But this is all left up to the people of Georgia to make that final decision and up to the members of the legislature to frame this issue so that the public knows what they're voting for and what whether it would be for the positive or the negatives. It's not the old days of, you know, I, I think of my, my grandparents would have seen in Las Vegas where they would go go to play at the slot machine. They'd have a low cost hotel room and they'd sit, sit and hang out at the buffet for a meal. Today's customers want upscale hotel rooms. They want spas. They want upscale restaurants. They want unique dining experiences. They want a plethora of both gaming and non-gaming activity where this becomes an entertainment complex that's driven and anchored by the gaming <laughs> facility, but you have these other amenities that are all part of that. One of the things that we have always stated that if you're gonna do any that type of gaming, it needs to be focused on creating those destination resort style places that you can be proud of, that you know that's gonna bring that economic return. And then maybe it's on a limited basis. So if it's like, okay, it's a 10 year license or 20 year license and where's the development go after that. But I think that you're always should be taking into account is what is those industry trends. The average person only plays about two to four hours a day when they stay with us. So they're looking for other things to do, whether it's in our resort or whether it's in the restaurants down the road, the golf courses, the deep sea fishing expeditions. One thing not to, to miss, our businesses around these operations will also rise due to the people looking for the local experience. When these things open up, the gaming revenue is always the big big dog. That's where you make the money. If you're gonna be a well-rounded city and a well-rounded resort, you want the non-gaming revenue to catch up. That means you've got good restaurants, you've got good entertainment, you've got good conventions. The gaming revenue doesn't want to go down, but you want them to catch up. And if you can get to a point where the non-gaming revenue is up with the gaming revenue, that means you got a pretty well-rounded economy, you got a great city, you got a good resort. That's what you want. Good people can disagree with each other. So, and I just want you to know that's how I see this issue here today. There's no doubt that this can have a negative impact. You know, I really do not believe that this type of industry is a positive promotion of family and financial stability today. And yet we claim today that most <laughs> of what we do down here, we do and correct, correct in that we do that. And that is that it's for the children. But I will tell you today that the people who are suffering the most from the legalization of social vices are children. So I want to talk just a minute about problem gambling. Uh, because everybody acknowledges, even the industry acknowledges, that, that there are people who will become problem gamblers. And as we expand a market, that creates new gamblers. Let's say 10% of Georgians decided to gamble if we got any new form of gambling at a 4% rate, that would create 40,000 new problem gamblers in the state of Georgia, 40,000 people. But uh, that are not only ruining their own lives, but the lives of many others around them. The crime rate goes up 10% in a ring, not in the casino, because look, they hire good people to take care of their own property. It's outside of that property. And the, again, this is FBI statistics, not me just talking, uh, and not from a movie. Uh, they uh, have, have studied it, and 10% every year that the casino is in operation, not just the first year. Every year, it goes up 10%. So in, in its core, commercialized gambling, this is what separates it from any other business in America. Commercialized gambling is a form of financial fraud, and it results in life-changing financial losses for millions of Americans and thousands of your constituents right here in Georgia. The American people, okay, over the next eight years are expected to lose $1 trillion of their personal wealth 
to government sanctioned gambling. So gambling does real harm. It hurts people. Problem gambling is something that we need to take very seriously uh, in this state um, and, and everywhere. At some point, we have to look as a legislature, what are some of the social vices that are creating the economic problems that we're having to go raise tax money for? And wouldn't an ounce of prevention be worth a pound of cure somewhere in this process? I'll be the first to tell you when in 2008, when they were starting to build the casino, uh, you know, I was a young narcotics guy and I was like, man, we're going to be so busy. It's going to, it's going to explode. And I would be bored to death if that's all I had to work right now, because it's just, it's just not there. It's not happening. And again, it's management. If things are managed correctly and you have your law enforcement on board, you, you don't have those problems. My community was very skeptical of MGM coming. There was talk about crime and prostitution and some of the things that I heard mentioned earlier. And I think that may be true in every jurisdiction where there's no experience or no knowledge of seeing this firsthand. In my community, crime has actually gone down. I went back through all the way to 2009 through our reports. Uh, we've never had a prostitution case uh, that's taken place um, at our casino, nor uh, was there one in our county of 38,000 people. Blue Chip opened just before I took office as LaPorte County Sheriff. I heard fears about thefts, robberies, prostitution, and other crimes that were going to occur because of a casino. None of these concerns have ever become a reality. The Blue Chip is one of the most crime-free areas in the community. The relationship between Blue Chip security and law enforcement agencies is second to none. Every jurisdiction in the world thinks about what gaming can do to society. Is it going <coughs> to hurt people's lives, ruin their situation? And we take responsible gaming very, very seriously. There's good news and bad news. The good news is a very small percentage of society will be addicted to gaming. However, the bad news is that small percentage, it can ruin their life. So you can't ignore the fact that there is a percentage, there's probably a percentage right now in Georgia, just like there was in Massachusetts, that's already has a gaming problem. And so you have to identify that, you have to work on that. Uh, it's a serious issue, we take it very seriously, we're very proud of our track record. We have full-time counselors on the gaming floor in Massachusetts offering advice. We have training for our employees to identify who might look like they might be having a problem. It's sometimes, it's often easier to identify these people than you might think. You can identify somebody that's having a significant issue. You can get them counseling. You can, you know, work with them on exclusions. You can do a number of things. So um, as you go forward, if you go forward with your gaming legislation, you can't be, um, you can't be scared of this, but you also can't ignore it. You need to have uh, regulations and enforcement that's very strong. When it's unregulated and unfunded, it's, it's the Wild West. So in states that have put this in and have actually built into the legislation ways to, to work on it, it's been a big benefit. We had a problem whenever we first put in 1993, I guess, when we started um, uh, gambling in Georgia, two issues that we did not foresee was local control. There's none. Um, you can go without any uh, say so by the local governments whatsoever. I hope we can repair that. We also didn't anticipate with the um, lottery, the compulsive gaming mental illness piece. I hope we can fix that. And I guess just so that I'm clear, um, we have two states in the United States that are non-gambling states. I wanna make sure you'd be okay if Georgia went, joined Hawaii and Utah as no gaming whatsoever. Absolutely, okay. absolutely, thank you. <laughs> Until recently, federal law prohibited sport, legalized sports wagering outside of Nevada and a handful of other states. Yet illegal sports wagering has continued to flourish across all mediums, in person, over the internet, and most recently through sophisticated mobile applications. <coughs> this illegal market has capitalized on enormous consumer demand while offering no protections to consumers, <coughs> athletes, or sporting events, and providing no, no revenue to state taxpayers. Georgia now has a chance to fix this, and today's hearing is an important step in that direction. MGM is committed to providing a cutting-edge sports wagering product 
that protects integrity and gives consumers a compelling reason to move from the black market to a safe, regulated environment. The most recent estimate that we have suggests that it's about a little under $500 million in gross gaming revenue, so a little under $500 million in uh, taxable operating revenue that the, that, that the operators would have in this market. And so then this, the, the state's cut of that would be whatever the tax rate is. If nothing else comes from all these meetings and hearings, the fact that this is an economic engine for this state uh, is first and foremost. And when you look at this, this industry, it's a $261 billion industry, it has a huge economic impact on our country. <coughs> the charge of this committee, as I understand it, is to look at economic development and economic growth opportunities. You have a chance to put your own Georgia specific sort of stamp on this industry, depending upon what it is you desire whether you desire a long-term economic development strategy or just a lot of tax revenue up front. Why would anybody want to do this? I think you can see how Boston ticks off all these. First of all, urban renewal. Casinos don't mind taking on a site that some other people might not really like. You can cause urban renewal because of the financial structure and the, the urban planning issues we have that might not happen otherwise. Sustainable development. You should push any casino developer to be very green. You shouldn't put up with an old fashioned resort. You should make sure it's very sustainable. Career employment opportunities. Again, we create, anywhere we go, we create thousands and thousands of jobs. We have 30,000 up around the world and that's gonna grow and grow and grow. Uh, significant expansion of tax benefits. You saw those numbers. It's hundreds of millions of dollars a year between the gross gaming tax, the regular sales tax, the income tax, and then the separate, but the surrounding host communities. Hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars a year, which is already happening now. Um, finally, the economic impact of primary and secondary spending. We bring in a lot of tourists. Uh, Massachusetts is already a heavy tourist area. We're already increasing that significantly. People, are, people wanna come to Boston. We have regular customers. We have a database you can't believe, and people around the world that already visit our resorts are saying, I'm going to add, I'm adding Boston to my list. I'm going there for a week with my family. We're going to go every year. So we're bringing in a significant amount of tourism that didn't exist uh, before. The reality is from an economic per perspective, it was one of the best things that could have happened to our community. Gaming impact to date, uh, as I say, six casinos, really it's five casinos and one racing. You know, uh, 962 million in taxes. 15,000 plus jobs supported, 713 million in annual wages supported. For Prince George's County, uh, there are a total of 4,833 employees at the facility. In 2009, when the casino opened, um, there was a lot of speculation on what was going to happen. Um, and the main thing that happened was it helped our county prosper. Many people don't know that, you know, we are just a, a, a small tribe of 3,000 people, but we've been able to grow economically across the state of Alabama and worldwide. We were a very poor tribe. We, under, we understand what it means not to have the jobs. We understand what it means not to have the education opportunities. We understand what it means not to have just infrastructure of development or government itself. This was about providing the opportunities for jobs, for community growth and development. And Wind Creek Atmore is in the heart of our reservation. And so we made the decision then to build there because that was what this was about. It was about funding our government and it was about creating jobs. We need big projects like these casinos in this state to, uh, for these men and women to come work to. Uh, casinos will, will bring more people into our apprenticeship programs, which leads to more skilled workers. We always hear we have a skilled worker shortage and it is so true. Uh, one way we solve that is by bringing more people in, in bring more people in to get trained, uh, and jobs like this can do that. I called my counterpart out in Vegas from the building trades and asked him for some information on, you know, the kind of numbers I could look at if we were to be so fortunate to have this opportunity in Georgia. And he said that speaking of one single ca casino development, he said that project took place over multiple years, had three different phases. The construction provided $1.5 billion in construction wages and $84 million in taxes while employing several thousands of workers. Once open, the property would account for 8,500 direct jobs, 3,300 indirect jobs. The development is, was projected and did generate over $155 million in annual tax revenue.
Those sound like pretty good deals to me from where I sit. With these kinds of results, I can see great opportunities for the state of Georgia in the construction sector, as well as many other benefits for the state of Georgia as well. The rural Georgia continues to struggle, and here is an opportunity to bring some really nice uh, jobs and industry, uh, you know, uh, sustainable industry to uh, rural Georgia. I'm talking about horse uh, farms, uh, breeding farms, uh, hay farms, oats, uh, trainings, training uh, facilities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. I think it's a great opportunity for rural Georgia, and I think it's important to, uh, to mention that. 96.8% of our team members live in the state of Louisiana, so I think that will be much the same here in your process here, that we're going to be putting folks in Georgia to work. 54% uh, female, over 50% minority. If I do the numbers right, it's about 52% of the folks are making at least $26 or more an hour of the workforce. The uh, local community college has recognized the industry so much that they just opened up a new 28,000 square foot facility funded by the local taxes generated by the resort to recognize that we're building a hospitality, gaming, and culinary college. So I think you see today that a lot of these kids, maybe not everybody's cut out for a four-year degree, and they're giving these folks training in two years and giving them real jobs and uh, they can't keep up with the demand. We're, we're having to outsource to labor with contract just because we can't find enough folks to work in Lake Charles. Arts and culture in Georgia has been a tremendous asset to attract businesses and corporations to Georgia for decades. Today, I'd like to share our concerns with the proposed casino gaming legislation. Fueled by gaming revenue, casinos pay significantly above market rates for talent, which local venues cannot afford to do. The result will be artist fees will increase for all facilities in Georgia, and casinos will set the bar on price. Other venues in the state will not be able to compete. In addition, <coughs> casinos hurt local venues and businesses that they rely on them by imposing other <coughs> restrictions. These restrictions are ex exclusivity clauses in which talent performs only at facilities owned by casino operators, radius clauses in which talent cannot perform at other venues, and duration clauses in which talent cannot return to the vicinity for a certain length of time after performing at the casino. So what do Georgians stand to lose in this case? Civic assets, venues that offer classical music, opera, and others, downtown anchors, highly revered source of community pride, nonprofit institutions and historical institutions, and investment in taxpayer operated venues. Your argument is about a competitive advantage and a number of these businesses do receive um, advantages offered by the state of Georgia. This new industry is asking for none of those. The state invests heavily and in this, in my estimation, my words heavily, in a number of these nonprofits and all sorts of nonprofits across the state of Georgia. And the marketplaces that we've heard testimony over the last couple of years, many of them I've visited, and they all have wonderful arts and entertainment. DC has tremendous arts and entertainment throughout that, that marketplace. Boston has wonderful arts and entertainment throughout that, that marketplace. So the suggestion that we're gonna decimate an entire industry, I think is a little bit, uh, far-fetched uh, from what we've seen in other marketplaces. We always knew that we wanted to do our best to try to give back to our government to provide those services that we needed. So we have brought roughly around 3,000 tribal members, uh, citizens of, our, of the tribe, and we probably service another 6,000 uh, Indian descent through education, health care services, and such. But the only way that we were able to do that was through our gaming opportunities. And I think that's what you're looking for in the state of Georgia, how you can give back to your local communities. Among the states with legalized gaming, Iowa is the only state that requires uh, regulated casinos to contribute a portion to their local charities and communities. So this provides a great opportunity for uh, nonprofits to get some money. They basically earmark uh, $60 million a year for the general fund and the rest of the gaming tax goes to rebuild Iowa infrastructure. Basically all of our universities have new buildings and uh, a lot of other uh, other things that they do with it. Vision Iowa was an economic development program uh, to help provide grant funding for communities to build uh, economic development, you know, event centers and different, uh, different projects. Our view on gaming is gaming works well when it benefits the most people. 
That's why we bring local shareholders in. Our family usually owns about 50% of the company, and then we have 500 local sh shareholders that own the other 50%. And then you try factor in the nonprofit piece, you factor in the tax dollars to the state. I mean, gaming in Iowa has been a great success. It's a good model. When we built Potomka, they didn't. They had a part-time fire department. And so we negotiated agreement with the, uh, with the city and the county that we went in and we paid for, and we pay for the full-time fire department along with the ladder truck. Because if you do build a hotel, you're gonna need a ladder truck and some of these rural, uh, rural fire departments don't have that. Uh, we've had the opportunity to donate to hospitals, uh, uh, law enforcement, arts and sciences, uh, city and state projects. Each one of the counties that we are sitting in, they automatically get a million dollars a year for any type of projects that they would like to participate in. They just, one of the things we do ask them to do is provide us if they're infrastructure projects, if they're transportation projects, just to have that checks and balance in place within a county commission. But we had to make a decision back in 2008 whether we're going to compete in the film business. And while other states were deciding that they're gonna cap or sunset some of their provisions, Louisiana comes to mind along with uh, North Carolina and others. Uh, and they lost out on the on the back end because that's where the credit on these states were given. Georgia was all in. And today, because we made that decision, we're a $12 billion industry. We do more films and movies than, than California. Uh, but, you know, it's all about that decision, whether we're all in. And I just wanted to thank you because that took... Um, it took a lot of courage to uh, to make that decision back then whenever we weren't sure what the future was gonna be. So uh, you made the right decision, you were all in, and, uh, and of course the citizens in your area have benefited. I thought that this comment from uh, the executive director of the Boys and Girls Club of Greater Dubuque was, was pretty telling. And I quote, I would tell any executive director from a Boys and Girls Club that if you can get gaming in your community, they are good. I think that overall, they're employing more people and they're providing more educated people with positions. They're having a positive impact. A lottery has been such a tremendous success in providing money to the Hope Scholarship and to the university system. And that's how I look at that. And that continues to grow. That's the reason I continue to think that as long as that stays up and we give the, and provide the tools for that, then if the people of Georgia legislate and legalize brick and mortar casinos or horse racing or the bulk of sports betting, that's something that go, could go to another vital area of the state's needs. When I go out and talk to, to groups, I very, or every single time I ask the question, how many of you are in this room are Hope Scholars, parents, graduates, or grandparents of Hope Scholars? We always get the, the big raise of the hand but I really love asking the question of how many of you are Hope Scholars and have come back to your community? Um, because that's when you know this has really worked. Your vision, the vision of Governor Miller, the legislature, the legislature at the time, and everybody who has supported since then, it has worked. And so as you go into your communities, you're there daily and you're talking to groups, I would encourage you to ask that question because it's really exciting to see that a lot of our Hope Scholars have not just stayed in Georgia, but have come back to their communities and they're that next business generation. We're talking about brick and mortar construction. We're talking about tourism, resorts, that brings people into the state, not just people in Georgia, it brings other people in. The same way people go to Mississippi or Vegas or <laughs> wherever they may go. We're talking about jobs in construction. That's real dollars. We're talking about jobs in material. We're talking about sales taxes paid. We're talking an industry. They're not like everybody else with their handout. They want a tax credit. Change is inevitable. A lot of things that I thought I would never see in Georgia that I have lived long enough to see. Now, it's obvious that there are two sides to this story. My biggest desire is, and I, I think that the people ultimately have to be, we have to believe enough in the people to give them the right to decide. The polls indicate that the people want to have a chance to weigh in on this. The people want to have the chance to weigh in on it, I think they need to be given that opportunity. I, for one, 
would hate to be stand in the way of what even 60% of my constituents want, and it made it very plain. And I would look forward to hearing from Georgia on this question. to the committee, most of the committee members have seen this. This was a product of about a year and a half's worth of work. At that time, the virus came last year and the discussion was shut down. At that time, myself and some others had been promoting the idea that if the people of Georgia in their wisdom chose for the state to go in this direction, that would have been some billion and a half dollars in revenue that could have gone. And some of us like myself were adamant that that money should go to the number one hole in the state budget and that's healthcare. Uh, because of that, it didn't move forward because of the virus as many things fell through the cracks last year. Uh, there's still a lot of discussion. Uh, the Casino industry is still interested in Georgia. Uh, the sports betting people are interested in Georgia. The athletic teams uh, in Georgia, they want sports betting. I'm not sure in what form because I've yet to been able to figure that out. Uh, there's been a sharp division in the, uh, in the mindset uh, about how to get it done. Most of us who heard the attorneys that we've talked to enough constitutionalists to say that uh, it would take a constitutional amendment. Gambling's gambling, whether it's sports betting or whether it's destination casinos or horse racing or whatever it may be. Just the same as when Governor Miller proposed the lottery in 1990 in his campaign and it was voted favorably in the 92 referendum. People of Georgia chose that, but the lottery was chosen as a specific form uh, to the members of this committee. I do not know if we will see as a committee this issue, but then again, we may see it. Uh, this committee has been known to do some rather dandy handy work when it comes to drafting uh, legislation. So for your benefit, I wanted y'all to be updated and the members who sat through this last year for this to be put on their mind <coughs> about the proper way uh, and to be prepared. Is there any questions from any of the committee about this issue? If there's not, then I have uh, forgot to call on a gentleman. Representative Carpenter wanted to, uh, he did not get a chance to do a morning order. Now we don't call it morning anymore and here we call it a points of personal privilege and he's going to be recognized at this point. Thank you, Chairman. You know, we come down here to the Capitol and it's a, uh, it's a sacrifice for uh, each and every one of us. And so I'm here today proudly to be serving on the Regulated Industries Committee, but my heart's in uh, Dalton. Uh, today they announced that my brother Kit Carpenter has announced the uh, head football coach for Dalton High School. He has been a coach for 20 years for Dalton High. I was a you know, Georgia State Defensive Player of the Year for Dalton High back in the early 90s, and so he's committed his life to, the, to our program, and today is a, a big day in the Carpenter household. And I just want to tell you I'm proud of you. Well, go right ahead. Is this the, is this the Dalton Catamounts? Is That's that? Exactly right. Is no, sir, no, sir, no, sir. Ninety was it? Ninety one, ninety two. We came up there, the cardiac cats, and ended the season for the Dalton Catamounts. I believe it was. 
You are correct. Uh, Papa Jones broke our heart in the, in the fourth quarter. Uh, my brother, he was a, my brother was a fresh sophomore that year. So, well, our our heartiest congratulations to your brother, and uh, hope he has a, a pretty good career. And if he's a pretty good coach, then maybe he needs to be drafted by the Falcons. They seem to be having a little bit tough time for the last twenty years. Ladies and gentlemen of the committee, I thank y'all for being here today. Uh, next week, if, as I'd said earlier, if there's any of the industries or associations that wishes to take just a few minutes uh, prior or during the start of next week's meeting, if they want to speak about their related industries, would be more than welcome to. Uh, for the committee subcommittees, uh, chairmen have been named. Uh, those that have any interest in front of the committee or business in front of the committee, they've already seen the list. My congratulations to the committee chairmen uh, this year. You've got bills assigned to you, and I would urge you to work post haste to get into it, perfect them. If you can't perfect them, then you can keep working on them because this committee does not like to see unperfected bills come to the full committee. That being said, my thanks again, and we will see y'all next week.